Well, good morning, Northside family. My name is Jim. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and it's great to be with you guys today. We're going to have an awesome Whether you're online or you're here in the room, we're just blessed that you're here and that you're taking time out of your weekend to hang out with us and grow with us. And if you're relatively new to this place, we're particularly blessed that you're here. You're an answer to our prayer. We pray that God would send people here, that we would get to know them and they would get to know us and get to know Christ ultimately. And, and so we're so blessed that you're here. If you're visiting with us or you're relatively new here, haven't made yourself known here yet, we'd love for you guys to stop by the living room on your way out the doors here today. That's in the carpeted lobby on the right-hand side. We've got some staff that would love to connect with you, some volunteers that would love to connect with you and just get to know you a little bit and maybe maybe understand more about who we are through your eyes. And so please stop by there. If it's your first time there, we've got a small gift for you and we'd love to just encourage you in next steps of your faith. So thank you for being here. For all of us, we're starting off a new series today, Jonah. And we got four weeks in the book of Jonah. Matt Reagan's going to kick it off today. And you guys, you're in for a treat. It's going to be a powerful message. It's not just the storybook you knew as a kid. It is a profound teaching for us today. And we're definitely looking forward to growing in that one together. So make sure you're here for every week of that. In addition to that, we want to talk about the school supply drive. Over in the concrete lobby, beyond the carpeted lobby, there's a display there for us. We've got one more week to collect some goods so that we can encourage students and give them some supplies that they need before they go to school. And school's coming way too quick, people. Way too quick. So we got one more week to gather those things so we can give those away. You can check it out at our uh, digital resource area, or you can check it out over in the concrete lobby to get more information. You can go shop and then drop those things off, or you can do it all online. But we'd love for you guys to participate with that. Now, I want to talk about something that we talk about every week, but I want to do it a little bit different today. We talk about our offering every week. Most of the time, we talk about ways to give. Sometimes we talk about why we give. And today I want to just take a minute to acknowledge that there's obstacles to giving and they're everywhere in every season of life, right? We've all got them, we've all been through them. And so I want to acknowledge those things and as we talk about this, please hear this. Let grace be the dominant theme. There is grace in this and we want to keep growing in this. So if you would, please stand with me. We're going to pray, and we're going to use this time of prayer over our offerings, good or bad, wherever they are, and then walk that into a time of worship. But please pray with me. Father, we acknowledge that there have been a lot of seasons in life where there's been demands that have conflicted our hearts and our minds and even our wallets. We acknowledge that there's times when we've been overwhelmed with the, the early years of autonomy and having an income but no responsibility and, and perhaps we've spent in the wrong way. We acknowledge that there's times when we're overwhelmed with a crushing debt of a mortgage or credit card bills and we somehow have lost our focus on a first priority of you. And we acknowledge that in those middle years we're trying to save for a retirement and sometimes we lose sight of our ultimate retirement in you. We fear whether we'll have enough at the end, and sometimes we replace our trust in you with our trust in our resources. We acknowledge that those things are challenges for us, and we also celebrate those times when we have trusted you beyond what is conventional wisdom from this world, and we've watched you show up. We've watched you provide. We've watched you be glorified by the way that we give. And Lord, while we're a generous church, we just acknowledge that there are barriers everywhere. There's fear everywhere. Would you help us overcome those fears? Would you help us to worship you with our tithes and our offerings at every stage of life? That you might be glorified. That this church might have the resources needed to go and do and become and inspire and encourage and reach the lost, connect the unconnected. So Father, help us. Thank you for the grace and the journey. Help us to grow. And Lord, right now for all of us, it doesn't cost us a dime to make another offering. We're going to offer you the sacrifices of praise. And as we call out to you and cry out to you and sing of your glory, would you be glorified by the attitudes of our hearts, the focus of our minds on the one, the primary audience here and now, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We give you our worship, this humble offering today. Be glorified in our midst. And everybody said... Amen. Let's worship, church.
holy interruption, lead us back to you. We need your perspective to fix our eyes on We were waiting without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Pray. 
spread till that storm was moved for good for the lamb it conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born Y'all can go and take a seat. It's because of our King Jesus that we are made alive, that we're made new, that we're made clean, that the church of Christ is born, that we have his spirit dwelling within us. And when we choose to declare Jesus as our savior, we are saying it is no longer a life that we live for ourselves, but a life that we live for Christ pouring out his spirit, pouring out his goodness. And I love how Paul puts it in Galatians 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right now we're gonna go into a time of communion like we do each week. And when we rest in, and reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made, his body broken, his blood shed for our sake. Out of his pure heart, out of his pure desire to see us be made new. May we also know and rest in the fact that we are to be crucified along with him. Letting go of our worldly desires, letting go of our selfish desires and saying, Jesus, I choose you. I surrender myself to you just like he has done for us. So let's go ahead and take a time of communion together today with that truth in mind.
we continue singing and worshiping together, we're gonna be singing a new song called Follow. And this song is exactly what it sounds like. It is purely about our heart's desire to follow Jesus, to joyfully surrender to him, to bear his name, to say yes to what he has for us in our lives. And just like we read in Galatians, we are saying it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I love how Jesus solidifies this truth when he's speaking to his disciples in the gospel of Matthew. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus never promises that following him is going to be easy, that it's gonna be without obstacle, that there aren't gonna be temptations or there aren't gonna be times that we feel distant from him. But what he does say is no matter the cost, no matter what, take up your cross and follow me. And that's exactly what we're gonna be declaring and praying as we sing this song together. So if you'll go ahead and stand up with us, we can sing this song as a prayer of surrender no matter where we are in our lives. We may not know all the words yet, but we can still let the truth soak in and let it be a prayer for us today as we declare that we follow Jesus no matter what. I know true freedom I count it all joy To take up my cross I'll follow These earthly wells Have left me thirsty All worldly wisdom Comes up empty Only your word and only your ways I'll follow. What a joy. Trusting you becomes a rest. I have resolved no matter the cost, I'll follow. What a joy it is to fall, Jesus. What a gift it is to bear his name. What
in every single circumstance and every single moment, may we realize that our faith in you, that our surrender to you is what we can cling to. That no matter the cost, we continually have the courage to follow you, to pick up our cross, to surrender fully to you no matter what. Because we know your power, we know your goodness, we know the love and the mercy that you continually pour out on us. May we rest in that and joyfully surrender to you. It's in Jesus' name we all said, amen. Well, right now we get to celebrate a couple of fellow believers declaring their faith in Jesus through baptism. Well, good morning, church family. We are so excited that you are here today to celebrate Maddie's baptism with us. Now, there are two things that I want you all to know about Maddie. First is that her sister Hannah is in the water with us. Hannah, you have had a huge influence on Maddie's faith, and so thank you for continuously pointing her back to Christ. And Maddie, you are so kind, you are so joyful, you are so loving, and you love Jesus so much. I'm so excited that we get to be here in this moment with you today on a day that you're going to remember forever. So with that being said, I have a few questions for you. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. Do you believe he died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And do you take him today to be your Lord and Savior forever? Yes. With, with that being said, um, Hannah and I get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is my friend Dave. Dave has been uh, attending here in a part of Northside for many years and uh, most recently has been serving as one of our coordinators in our health and safety ministry. Does a great job with that and over the last couple of months Dave and I have had conversations about his faith journey and he has uh, made the decision to step into baptism today to declare his faith in Jesus and I'm so excited and grateful that I get to be a part of this special moment. So Dave, just going to ask you a few questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he died on the cross and was raised from the grave for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And do you accept him as both your personal Savior and the Lord of your life? Yes. Well, because of that good confession, I get to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to be buried with Christ and raised to new life. Northside family, how y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, we are going to talk about Jonah today. We're starting a series. We're going to talk about the extravagant love of God, and we're going to talk about why Jonah's the worst evangelist you've ever seen in your life. And before we do that, um, because I think you know me, if we're going to talk about God loving people, then we're going to get up on our feet right now. We're either going to hug, high five, fist bump if you're that guy. Uh, but just get up on your feet and say hi, hello to a couple people around you. Say, man, you're loved. God loves you. Glad you're here. <laughs> if it's somebody you came with and you give them a hug, it'd be great. Watching you non-huggers is my favorite thing of the day. You're like, I, I touched one person. Are we done? Yeah. Grab a seat, grab a seat. Um, well, I, I, I just want to say this. I think that you know this, um, but God loves people. Amen? And he doesn't love us. He, didn't lo he doesn't love me because I was lovable. Anybody else? 
Like, I, I, I did not start off, I'm not loved by God because of my pedigree, because I was so good, because I was like, God looked at everybody and he was like, that one is the one who's better than everybody. When he found me, when he found me in the middle of my family, we were broken, we were hijacked, we were broke down. And not only did he come to me then, but it's even worse. I figured out his love, I found his love, and then I ran and did my own thing. Anybody else? And I just, and I just thought, man, I, you know what? I think I could do life better than him. So I was like, I know you got your thing and I like the salvation thing and I wanna eventually get to heaven, but I'm gonna do it my way. And so then I just ran and I did things my own way and I tried it with my own ego and my own stuff, my own pride and my own sufficiency and I thought I was the man. And come to find out, I got sidelined, broke down, busted. Anybody else? And guess what, man? The extravagant love of God found me. And he just keeps loving me. And if there's, if there's anything that I know to be true, it's this, God loves people. He loves people. There's a reason that, that somebody is holding up a sign at every baseball game, every college football game day that says what verse? John 3, 16, because it's just true, man. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave we talk about giving, he gave his one and only son that who, whoever, whoever, that's crazy, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God loves people. Don't you wish more people knew that? Like I, I, I wish so bad that people could experience that kind of love, but I, I just have to be honest. Um, I think you and I know there are so many people around us that do not know that God loves them. You know that, right? I mean, I would say probably the lion's share, the lion's share of the people that live in our neighborhoods, that hang out at our high schools, at our workplaces, I would say the lion's share of people don't really know that God loves them. So my question for today is, and I don't want to beat us up, but I just want to ask the kind of an honest question to myself and to you. So if God loves them, then my question is, and we know it, how are we doing at telling them? Got quiet. So Barna, Barna, I don't know if you know Barna, but Barna is apparently um, an entire organization full of just straight up nerds, man. They're just doing polls. They're polling the country. They're sending stuff out. And so they decided to poll the entire country, believers, people who would call Christ, you know, like, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's who I am. And so they sent out, they sent out a study and millennials, Gen X, boomers, elders, uh, Zoomers, like the whole deal, all of them came back, Gen Y, and said, um, put them all together, and they came up with a stat that 94 to 97% of them said the best thing that could happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, you all know, 94 to 97%, y'all, we can't agree on anything. Did you watch the debate? I'm not going there. <laughs> we can't agree on anything, 94%, y'all. But 94% of believers were like 100%, the best thing that could happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus, 94%. The next line is 95% to 97% of them said, part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. Can I get an amen? So literally, I just wanna say it like this. Like, yes, there is a, you know, who are the, who are the 5%? I don't know, they're not huggers, you know what I'm saying? I don't know who they are. There's always, there's always those people. But Christianity in general agrees on two things. One is that Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to you and that part of my faith, part of following the one that I say is the best is to share him with somebody else. You ready for the next step? It's the best data I could find. It could be wrong. I don't think it's terribly wrong. The best data I could find is that while both of those are true, Roughly 90% of Christians have never personally shared Jesus with someone. Does that give you a little pit in your stomach? And you're like, well, you know, that's, that's, that's the people that show up on Easter. You know what I'm saying? Like they call themselves Christians. They're not really, they're not, you know, we don't count them. You know what I'm saying? 65% of elders, deacons, leaders in churches have never personally shared Jesus with somebody. Is that crazy? And so I just thought to myself, well, that's probably not true in this church, right? 
Like surely this church is, is totally different. I mean, you're, y'all are nice. I get like 50 hugs after service, it's great. But let me just pull out the stats. Let me put away the 94, 95, 97%. Let me put it aside. Let me just ask you an honest question. What are the names of the people from your life that by loving and sacrificial living around them, they have come to Christ? That's an honest question. Next question is this, and I, and I, don't, want to, I don't want to beat anybody up. Next question is some of you are like, you're, you know what? You're like, by the grace of God, yeah, I do have a couple names. My next question is, how long has it been? Because I think, I think you and I both know, like, Jesus is the best decision anybody could make, right? Amen? And you and I know that Jesus is asking us to share him. And if you're like, well, is he though? Well, let's just, let's just kind of clear that up because I don't want to just say things and not back it up with Scripture. Because Jesus, post-resurrection, I don't know if you remember this, but as he was heading to the cross last six months of his life, he kept saying to his followers, he kept saying, hey, after it's all done, after I've resurrected, I want you to meet me in Galilee. I want you to meet me on mountain. I want you to meet me in Galilee. As a matter of fact, when the ladies came and discovered that the tomb was empty, the one thing Jesus said was, remind the guys what I said, that I'm going to meet them in Galilee. And in that moment, he gathered 450 people, we find out in in Corinthians. We find out he gets the gathered church at the time together, and he gives them a message, and that message is captured in Matthew 28. It's the only gathering of everyone together while Jesus is there for him to talk to the church, to tell them what's on his heart so they would know with clarity what they needed to be about, and this is what he said. Matthew 28, 18 says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, y'all, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And don't just dunk them and go like, good luck. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you got to teach them, man. you got to walk with them. you got to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely, here's the deal. I understand what I'm asking you. But I'm going to I'm gonna be with you always to the very end of the age. I will not leave you. That's the mission. Mark 16, very end of the gospel of Mark, he just said to them, and now this one's with the 11 together. He said to the 11 together, he said, listen, I need you to know what's on my heart. I need you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, telling them the the good news. All creation, everybody has to know about the extravagant love of God and what he's done for them and how he's wooing them back to himself. That's who he is. So why? Why is there a gap? Why are we not, as a whole, why are we not living in a way that is leading people into a life in a relationship with Jesus? So I gotta be honest, man, my my wife and I, we have really struggled with this over the years. Because I, you know, here I am like doing this all the time, talking about God, talking about his extravagant love. The question is, is that how I live though? And I got to tell you, we've had some seasons where we have names. We have names of, of neighbors and coworkers and people that have come to Christ in our lives. But I'm just telling you, we will have entire seasons, years of our life. It's embarrassing to me to say this. We'll have entire years and seasons of our lives where we don't have the name of a lost person that's in the back of our mind. Where we don't have a new friend that we're trying to lead and to woo into coming to Christ. We, and, and I ask myself, well, well why, why do we do that? Why do we have these seasons where we know what matters and we know what he's called us to, but we're just not living that way? And so I just started looking, well, why do, why do we do that? Why does Sarah and I do that? Well, part of it, was it fear? Was it fear sometimes? You know, you know what I'm saying? Not like fear like somebody's going to, you know, we're in America. Nobody's going to be like, do you believe in Jesus? Like, it's, it's probably not going to happen. But are we afraid of looking like weirdos? Anybody? Have you ever been around that person where, you know, they're at that barbecue and they're, they're, they're like, you know, everybody's like, hey, do you want some barbecue on that chicken? They're like, you know who really likes barbecue? It's Jesus. You're like, slow down, bro. <laughs> Not your on ramp right there. You're just being weird, man. You're just being weird. And so is it a fear of just being weird? Like you just don't know the on ramps and you don't know how to get there and you're like, I don't want to be the weird dude. Like I'm, I'm just afraid of being that guy. Was it, was it apathy sometimes? I mean, were my wife and I ever checked out and overwhelmed with just raising kids, trying to get through life one day at a time? 
Do we find ourselves, even though we're Christians and we wanted good stuff for people, do we find ourselves just looking after our kids and our stuff and trying to get away for our vacation and making sure that our plans and our kids are becoming good and guarding them from the things and we just, we just start doing this kind of thing, protecting our little world? Was it because there were certain people that we just didn't like and wanted to avoid? I'm not gonna answer for my wife because she's a better human. But honestly, I'll speak for myself. Yeah, I've had people hurt me. I mean, I, there have been people that, I'm, that I look at and I'm like, dude, you are just a slimy dude. And then I like the way you treat your wife and I don't like the way you treat your kids and I know what you do behind the scenes. There have been some people that I, for some reason I just didn't like them. Yeah. Were there some moments where it was maybe the way we were raised? Because I don't know I like how you grew up in church, but people were like, we need to go take Jesus to those people. You know what I'm saying? And those people, you're like always like, I don't know how to talk. Well, I, like, who are those people? And how do I act around them? And then all of a sudden, I remember my wife and I moving into neighborhoods. We move into neighborhoods. And we got like, we got to take the gospel to those people or we're just bad Christians. So we started trying to do things, and the more we tried to do, the more it got weird. We had a season where we're like, we're just going to do it, man. We're going to get to know our neighbors. We're going to try. And we got out there, and we tried, and the people drove by, and they went in their garages, and the door closed, and we were like, hey, like us, please. And then we just felt like we were bad at it. Ever feel like you're just bad at it? And so you're like, well, maybe I'm just bad at this. And maybe this isn't for me, and maybe that's for special people, but, but I gave it a go, and I'm not really good at it, and I feel like I'm a failure, and I carry a little, gate, a, a little guilt, and we just started feeling ashamed for not being able to save people. And we didn't, we didn't know God wasn't asking us to save people, because only he saves people. We didn't understand that he was inviting us to love people. So here's what I want to do today. I want us to turn in our Bibles, Bible apps, whatever you got, to the book of Jonah. I love Jonah. If you want to go there, we're literally going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to have a series of unpacking the heart of God and why he loves people and how we can just get better at closing the gap from, from knowing what's best and then actually sharing with people, helping people get to that extravagant love that he has. And so Jonah's one of my favorites. Um, and, and if I'm being honest, the book of Jonah, we're going to unpack it. Jonah's, Jonah's quite possibly the worst evangelist you will find in the pages of scripture. And God is gonna use him to turn one of the largest and darkest cities in the, oldest, in the Old Testament to him. So here, let's do this, let's, let's set up Jonah. When you think of Jonah, you think about Jonah and the? Well, I'll tell you, three verses about a fish swallowing a guy and it's the, it takes over the, the whole story. Um, today, I just, just, I just need you to undo, just pretend the whale doesn't exist for a minute. Can we do that for a second? And I just need us, I need us to rethink the story because the beginning, the middle, and the end are about Jonah and a great city. It's a great city, and it's a city full of people. That, that city was Nineveh. I don't know if you know about it, but at the time, it was the, it was the capital of the Syrian army. And God came to his prophet, came to his friend, and whispered in his ear and said, Jonah, I want you to go to that city. Because those people in Nineveh, they didn't know it yet. But God loved them. And they mattered to him. And so, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says this. says, so the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amatai. Uh, and he just said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So, I, you know, for you, I'm going to give you a little context because you're like, sounds great. Go to preach the city. I, I don't know much about, I don't know about much about this, but I'm just going to say it like this. This is going to feel like to Jonah, like, like when God comes and whispers things in our ears. God, why would you ask me to go do something bigger than I know how to do? It, 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 it feels like I could never tackle something this big, more, this is dark. I don't know how to do it. Why are you asking me? I'm not that guy. Why is that? Well, Nineveh was a, was a city of 120,000 people at the time. And uh, just so you know, it, that would have been the largest, most likely the largest city on planet Earth at the time. He didn't, go, he didn't say, hey, I want you to go to this small little town with like 20 people in it. He's like, I want you to go to a city of 120,000, largest planet, 
And he says, and by the way, you have 40 days to do it. Clock just started. But Nineveh was not just a large city. Nineveh was a massively dark city. Nineveh, if you know anything about the Assyrian Empire, it was a war machine at the time. It was an empire. Um, Every empire is built on the backs of oppressing and abusing the poor, hurting women, like they were just commodities and children. It's never been different. So let me put it like this. Um, so many people, when they, when they talk about God's judgment of a city, this is another thing where sometimes we read the Old Testament, we're like, God, I don't get you. There's just the city and, and they don't worship you. And so you just want to go like pour down like fire and judgment on them. God, why are you so mean? Does God have control issues? Well, see, what he says is he says, um, I've heard word of what's going on. And I love this about God. And he's like, and I, I can't love people the way that I love people and continue to watch a political party just destroy a country. And I can't continue to watch just wealth, just literally like children and women are being sold as commodities. They're being used as playthings. I can't continue to watch this place just march through and just destroy things and just they're so vile and they're so corrupt. I can't continue to watch the family dynamics and the way these men are just sleeping with everything and they're taking their daughters and they're selling them. Like, like God just says, listen, don't you understand how much I love people and I can't let this go on anymore. Jonah, would you go please? It's one of my favorite things about God. He loves people. And when he loves people, he just wants to act. It's it's not out of judgment, it's out of kindness. And so there are not many evils that you can think of that aren't happening in in Nineveh. So Jonah, you need to know, Jonah has reason to be afraid. What's gonna happen in that place if I open my mouth? He has room for apathy. Like he, he, he could literally say, why should I care what happens to them? Like we have nothing in common. Literally in Jonah's mind, this city was filled with all the people that legitimately just deserve what they're getting. Like if you could pack a city, in his mind, if you could just pack a city with the ex-wives, the bad bosses, the neighbors, the father-in-laws or mother-in-laws, I'm sorry, whichever one, the coworkers that drive you crazy, the abuser in your life. I mean, if you could pack a city with just people of that religion or that ethnicity that you grew up not really caring about or not being able to trust or maybe the opposite political party that always posts on socials, especially after right now, it's crazy, y'all, just turn them off. But I think what Jonah found out is um, probably what I found out, and that is that um, the people that are the most challenging in the places where it seems the darkest tend to be the places that need him the most. And funny enough, they're the ones that seem the most open. So I was on a flight, and this flight, um, I'm not allowed to say the airline, but that airline, if you don't check in on time, you get put in C. Anybody know what I'm saying? It's the worst. So I got to fly from Chicago, I'm flying to San Diego, I show up, I'm like last dude on the plane. And so I'm walking on, and, and some of you fellas know, and I'm not small, I'm not huge, but I'm not small, and I know I'm getting on this plane and I'm going to be sitting in the, middle, in the middle seat between Bubba and Bubba. Anybody? I'm like, this is going to be the worst flight ever. It's like five and a half hours. I'm like, oh, Lord, you don't even like me. So I walk on the plane, and as I get towards the back, there is an aisle seat. And I'm like, you do love me, Lord. Like, thank you. And it's like uh, two young people. And I'm like, this is awesome. I walk up. This young guy looks at me and he's like, he's like, hey, you want to sit with us? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, that's awesome. Grab a seat. And I'm like, oh, come on. And I sit down. And he's like, because I just landed the deal of the century and we're going to get totally wasted. I'm like, well, <laughs> you win some, you lose some, you know? So I sit down. I can't make this up, y'all. Like, I sit down, as soon as I sit down, um, he starts hitting on this girl like you would not believe. And he's got no game. Guys, it's January, he's got a tank top on, he's a gym bro, and I'm like, bro, I'm not judging, but I'm kind of judging, you know? 
and she is just shutting him down. So, so finally he gives up and, and he turns over to me and he's like, man, you know, we were just talking about the best places to, um, I, know it's a, I know the age level of the room can be all over, where you can pay to get stuff that nobody should ever pay for. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, um, and, and, and this is crazy. He goes, she's in the adult entertainment industry. And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, this is really awesome. And he's like, so we're just talking about the best places on the planet to go to pay for stuff. And, 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 and then I find out that he's a drug dealer. And I'm like, Lord, what are we doing, man? I'm like, you know, headphones on, headphones off. Like, what are we, drug dealer, adult entertainment? What, 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 what? It's like five minutes into the, oh, we're not even, we haven't even closed the door. And then I just stopped. You ever do this? And I just thought, man, Lord, I can be so full of it sometimes if I can sit here and talk about the extravagant love of God that goes to dark places and does impossible things. If I'm going to sit in this seat and put my headphones on. You love them, man. You love them. This is crazy town. And I don't know what to say. Neither would you. But I'm available. So we start talking. I don't know what I said. They're, they're talking about things that I'm like, ah, I shouldn't hear that. <laughs> and all of a sudden he looks at me and he like, he start, his eyes get really watery because he's honest. He was like, you know, you, you would pay for that, right? And I'm like, nah. He's like, oh, are you married? I'm like, yeah, I'm married. He's like, but if you weren't, and I'm like, nah, still no. <laughs> and, and then he looks at me and he gets tears in his eyes. I'm like, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and he starts crying. And I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, are you a Christian? I'm like, I think so. <laughs> I'm confused, man. I don't know what's going on. And he just starts sobbing. You know, like ugly cry people. He's an ugly cry guy. And he starts trying to talk to me. I'm like, bro, I don't know what you're saying. They're de-icing de the plane. Everybody's looking at us. He's crying. He's got a tank top on. I'm like, what are we doing, man? And he's, he's sitting there crying. He just looks at me. He's like, are you a Christian? I'm like, yes. And he's like, you just don't understand. Like, like when I was 18, I accepted Christ, but then I ran off and I started sleeping around and I started dealing drugs and I started just living for myself and trying to build a brand. And, and I, I built this brand and, and, and I've got this girl and, and, and I'm just telling you, I met Arnold Schwarzenegger just, and I'm like, I don't know what that means, but he's like, and I just landed the deal of a century, but I just, in the shower this morning, I just felt so alone and I felt such a hole in my chest and I just felt like I was wasting my life and I don't even have believers in my life and I don't know where to go and I don't know where to turn. I just told God in the shower this morning, if you'll just put a believer in my life today, I just swear I'll change. And he was like, will you just talk to me about Jesus? I was like, nah, no, nah, just kidding. <laughs> so we're, we're sitting there and, and he says that and, and when he starts crying and talking to me, this girl over there, she got these fake nails and she's clicking on her. She's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> she's just clicking and she's like nasty looking and clicking and nasty looking and clicking. I'm like, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> and so all of a sudden she looks over and uh, right in the middle of that, she just said, so you guys are talking about like God and everything. I'm like, this is gonna be good. <laughs> She's like, and, and by the way, I need to keep in mind when she was talking about what she does as an adult entertainer, I'm sorry, I'm just being honest. She was talking about how he was like, oh, that's so cool. So you just like straight up take rich guys money and you do this, this, and this. And she's like, oh, it's not just rich guys. Some of them are poor, can't even feed their families. So that's, that was part of the conversation, I didn't even say it. So she looked at me and she's like, so you guys talking about God and everything? And like, I just don't understand how God can like allow, allow like poor people and, and like kids to go hungry and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, you are giving God character lessons. This is super interesting. And I was like, I don't know if you've been this way, but I'm like, God, I don't know what to say to her, to this, to now. I'm lost, man. I don't know. And Lord, was, I just felt like, and, and I'll just say this, when you start putting yourself in places to carry his kindness and goodness to people, you will experience things that are outside of your box. That's where it is. Everybody's like, well, I want it in my home and in my church service and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, how about you get out with my heart and watch what I do? But I'm just sitting there, I'm like, I don't know what to say. And I just got this nudge in my heart, just share your story. So I just said to her, I said, hey, 
This may sound kind of weird, and, and I don't know what your story is, and I don't know why God's character is on trial, but I, I need you to know that I'm a former abuse kid. I was abused when I was little, and it really wrecked my heart. And there for a while I did, I struggled with whether God, that was like God, but then what I found out was just how, God, how like God has been the only kind thing in my life. In every room I'm ever in, where he's in, I feel whole and complete. She just started bawling. She was like, I was abused as a little girl. Now she's crying, he's crying. We haven't even taken off yet. <laughs> the whole plane's like, <laughs> God loves people. Y'all, he just loves them. He so loves them. But in Jonah, we don't even get three verses in. God says, you gotta go to him. You gotta go to him, and you gotta go to him. I know it's dark. I know it's scary. I know you don't know what to say. I know. I, I, trust me, brother. I know. But I want you to go. But Jonah 1, 3. But Jonah what? He ran. He ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. And you're like, where's Tarshish? I don't need a map to tell you if, if Nineveh was in the Middle East this way, brother was like, hard pass. Headed to France, baby. He's like, no way, man. I'm going down to the dock, I'm hopping on a boat, and I'm headed to a place where I don't ever have to do that. And you're like, well, who would ever do that? So he's the only one. He's the only one that gets whispers in her ear like, hey, maybe you should talk to that neighbor, or maybe you should talk to that person, or maybe you should step in, or maybe, maybe that father-in-law that's driven you crazy for so long, like maybe you start, need to start praying for them, and you need to start loving them, and you need to start extending kindness. So he's the only one that's got a whisper like that and then decided to just go the other direction. No. You know that's not true. I know that's not true. So you get to thinking, who wrote Jonah? You're like, well, there's only one guy that could have heard the whisper. There's only one guy that knew what he was supposed to do, do, and literally he totally went by himself, as we know, to this port, and then he got on a boat. There's only one guy. They knew, the, the people on the boat knew that they threw him in the water. He's the only one that knew that he got swallowed by a fish, was in the fish for three days, and then got spit up on a, on a shore and had to go. His skin was now pink and his body was hairless. I'm like, bro, you should have went the first time. Now he's going pink and hairless into a city to preach a message. He's the only one in chapter four that we'll get to that we'll talk about even after they turned and they do turn. He's the only one that knows he still had a bad heart. Question. So then why did Jonah write Jonah? Because I think Jonah had a run in with the extravagant love of God and what he longed to do. And he didn't want to do it, and he ran from it, and he had to have a valley moment where he encountered the presence of God, and then God had to lead him out, and then even when he stepped in, he realized even when he did it, his heart wasn't always right. And I think the reason that Jonah wrote Jonah was because he was like, look, I was a part of turning like some other historian was like writing the story about Jonah and how he turned this big city. He's like Billy, the Billy Graham of the day. He just walked in there for 40 days and he preached and people came. And guess what? None of us can relate to that dude. All of us can relate to feeling like I'm the worst evangelist ever. And sometimes I walk past. And sometimes I run. And sometimes I do it wrong and I don't know what to say. And Jonah's like, yeah, and if God can use me, who can he use? You, me. So some of us, here's what I want to help us with today. We're Jonah. We're Jonah. And I just, I think that there are some people that, let me put it this way. I think there are some whispers. I'm praying for some whispers in the ears of my brothers and sisters here, and that he will whisper to us 
the extravagant plans, love, and grace that he has for the people around us. And my prayer is in, is at the, in the coming weeks that we will at least give him a shot by saying yes. One of my favorite passages, it's Isaiah. He was actually a contemporary or at least right around the time of Jonah. He's, is this a prophecy about Jesus and, and Jesus coming for all people? But it just says, Isaiah 40 verse 28 says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Do you not know? Have you, maybe, you just, maybe you just don't know. Maybe you haven't heard. Like the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He won't grow tired. He won't grow weary. His understanding, nobody can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. That's crazy. He increases the power of the weak, even youths. Little, little, the, the little ones, the young ones, they grow tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, Man, they renew their strength. They'll soar on the wings of eagles. They'll run and they'll not grow weary. They'll walk and they'll not faint. And I'll just say to some of you in this room, to me, I'm saying this to myself right now, to those of us in the room who know the reality of the gospel and are not taking it to the people around us, I have a question for us. Do we not know? I mean, do we not do we really not know that there's no one too far from his grasp, but there's no darkness that he can't step into? Have we forgotten the way that he turns impossible situations all the time? I just had six weeks ago, a couple walk into my office. The guy called me ahead of time and said, hey, I just need you to know my wife already had the lawyer. I didn't know about it, but she just told me today I'm leaving you. And, and, and he said, I gotta be honest, I think it's my fault. But she's agreed that she'll come in and talk, but I'm just telling you, it's not gonna go well. Will you pray? Will you meet? Is there anyone's like, bro, come on. So they walk in the office. She tells a story and I look at him. I'm like, bro, I love you, but it is you. You blew it, man. He's like, I know. And we talked and we prayed and we left that office and there's no chance. That's how it felt. It's how it felt to him, it's how it felt to her. But I'm just telling you, six weeks later, I got a text yesterday where he said, you're never gonna believe what happened. God's broken her heart, he's broken mine. We're both changing, we're both stepping forward and our marriage has a chance, praise Jesus. I mean, I, I've spent time in prisons, I've spent time in, in, in little like hell holes in like the middle of like, slums where there's like 1.5 million people, it breaks my heart. But I know him. Do you not know that even in places like that, it doesn't matter where you are. Do you not know that there is no situation too possible for him? Or maybe, maybe you just haven't heard. I mean, have you not heard that God loves you so extravagantly like with a kind of love you can't understand. He's known you. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He's watched you from a distance, just like that dark city. He's been longing to step in, longing to save, longing to help. And you've been holding all your cards together, trying to keep it together. And he's like, I, would you just let me love you, man? Would you let me step into your life? Would you let me allow you to just be whole? Would you receive the gift that I gave you? I gave my one and only son as a sacrifice of atonement so that you and I could be together again. I love you. Will you accept my love? Have you not heard? Then why are you running? I mean, if you know, if you heard, why would you ever walk away from telling somebody about that kind of love. There's another group of you in here and you're like, man, this is an evangelism message, that's great, but I've never experienced that love. I'm like in Nineveh, man, I'm rising and grinding, I'm, I'm trying to like get a little bit ahead, I'm trying to be a good person, but there's just, carnage around me, I feel like I'm doing it on my own. And I would just say, do you not know? Do you not know that I know you think your situation's impossible? Trust me, I know worse. And what I've seen him do in others, he can do for you. Have you not heard? 
And he loves you. He so loves you, man. Not some weird, like, weird Christian bracelet t-shirt love. Like the kind of love you've never experienced, like the kind of father you ever always longed for to step into your life and to hold you and to lead you and to speak truth into you. That kind of love. Why are you running? Why are you running from that love? Why would you not run into that love? So here's what I want to do. I, I just want to have everybody stand up on your feet. Can I do that? I'm going to pray two things. I'm going to pray a blessing. And I'm going to ask, and if you don't want this, too bad. I'm going to pray that like Jonah, because the father loves to come to his friends and speak to his friends. I'm going to pray that he would start whispering the names of some people that he's inviting you to, 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 to love. Not to save, he saves. Not your job, to love. So I'm going to pray that you do that. And then there's some of you in the room, I don't know who you are, but some of you in the room, you've never received that love. And I'm just telling you, you need to stop running today. You just need to receive his love. You can do that right where you are. If you need somebody to talk to right after service, we've got people, just stay where you are. People will come to you as everybody trickles out and does food and hangs and whatever they do. Just stay where you are, man. We'll just have a group of people come to you and pray for you. But he's available and he loves you. Let me pray a blessing over his father. I pray a blessing over this family before me. Father, at the end of the day, I think Jonah ended up becoming a very humble man who recognized that the only way that we share the extravagant love of God is just by grace through faith. We just join you. We don't know what we're doing, but we just take steps forward. God, I pray that you would give whispers in the ears of your sons and daughters in this room. Father, that you would make them discontent with years of, not, of, of just fruitlessness in the kingdom because they're protecting their stuff and just trying to keep their act together. But Father, I pray just by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to them, that you would woo them, that you would show them, that you'd give them a baptism of love for other people. And that because of that bapt 